that time for Jonathan Mason because um, he comes to us each and every month with laying down the law and today he's going to be telling everybody some great information about what to do about your filmmaking whenever you get your ideas all the legal aspects Jonathan Mason has the info for you so we want to welcome back to the show Mr. Mason how are you doing I am good it's always good to be back too I know I love the Serena Soul Brown show. And we love you, Jonathan. We really do. <laughs> <laughs> How you been? Oh, uh, I've been good. I've been good. Today was a little hectic, and I am actually didn't have time to make it back to the office, so I'm sitting in a parking lot, but hopefully <laughs> everything will be as good. And hopefully, I didn't have to even disclose that. Everybody wouldn't yeah, even have known. Yeah, I was ready to say, Jonathan, you didn't yeah. have to give anybody your personal information, but you know what? You're safe. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say exactly But you know, what. I had to give the heads up just in case, you know, ahead of time, let them know. Well, you know what? That's a good thing because we want everybody to know this show is truly live and that we get you where we get you. It's like get in where you fit in. So you're in a parking lot. And That's right. That's <laughs> right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you, have, you still have the great information that yeah. you have in store for us today. So yesterday, you know, I was reading one of the trades and, uh, I saw this article about this tattoo artist who was suing uh, the movie production company over the Hangover movie because of the tattoo that he did for Mike Tyson. Get out. And they have someone in this movie who's going to have that same tattoo. And he was like, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) I didn't give anybody permission to copy my tattoo, which I copyrighted. Are you serious? And so I was thinking, you know what? We hadn't talked about people who put things in movies and then this is a music show so i said well what about our music right. in film and so i thought that'd be a good topic for today it is but real quick before you even get into the music part so the guy had a tattoo and because someone else copied his tattoo he has rights yeah let me tell you about that uh, it's when you are doing movies or really any kind of production where something's even in a play and you're going to incorporate something copyrighted work whether it's a photograph or uh you know another say another tv show or a news clip and you're going to include that in your movie Uh you got to get permission now it was kind of unusual that a copyright would be on a tattoo i really hadn't heard of that before but if he created it it doesn't really matter if he puts it on a human body or on a piece of paper as long as it's created and it's fixed and he filed that registration with the copyright office, then, yep, he has rights. Now, you know, some people might say, well, that was a fair use or whatever, and they, they might get into that, but but on the surface, yeah, he, he's right. Wow. I didn't know that yeah, you could do incredible. that. Yeah, pretty incredible. Yeah, because I remember just to go back in time when Eve had those um, paws on her chest, or her breast. Yes. A lot yes. of girls. I saw a lot of girls walking around with it, but I guess because they weren't like in film or or taking photoshops. I don't know of themselves and putting it out there for consumption, for public consumption in terms of paying for it. Maybe I guess that's why there were no legal suits in that situation. I don't know. And, and it may be that a, a paw is not creative enough, as this design is more intricate. Because one thing about copyright is you have to have originality to it. Okay. So to say it's a paw, you know, that's just a common, you know, symbol of an animal or part of an animal's body, but this design that he, if he in fact created, well, he says he created it, and he did copyright it, so we assume that he created it, then that's more original and would get some better copyright protection. Okay, so do we know exactly what the tattoo looked like? Exactly what was it resembling? Do you know, do you know the tattoo that uh, is on Mike Tyson's face. Uh huh. It's oh, around yeah. his eye. You know that oh, one. That yeah. one that's on his face. And uh, I, they actually gave it a name. I think he. I think he calls it the tribal tattoo. I looked at the tried to look at the court documents, and he laid it all out. And so I don't know how exactly how it plays out in the movie, but I saw uh, a poster and the guy. One of the guys. I think he probably wakes up and has this tattoo on his face and has no idea. So that's the other thing is that the tattoo is an important part apparently is an important part of the plot of the movie and so that even is more of a reason for them to have gotten permission i got you but who in the world would want a tattoo like that on their face but anyway moving on since (laughs) this show is about music let's focus on the music in the film what agreements are required for you to use music in a film jonathan 
All right, well, I guess it, it depends on whether you're the songwriter or whether you're the film producer. For today, I'm going to switch up on this question and take it from the perspective of the film producer. Okay. Because if you're the film producer, you got to deal with two separate types of copyrights here because every re piece of recorded music has two copyrights in it. There's a copyright in the song and then there's a copyright in the actual recording and you, you might know, most people might know it better as the master. They say the record label owns the master even though I wrote the song. So if I'm a film producer, I have to go to the person or the company that owns the master right. and get a what they call a master use license and then I have to go to the songwriter and get a license that's called a synchronization license which they usually just call a sync license right. and get that from the songwriter so I have to get two separate licenses if I'm the film producer and the flip side of that is if I'm the writer then I can only give the permission to use my song I can't give permission to use the master okay. recording wow that's a lot of work it's a lot of work and people you know don't necessarily realize it and they um you know they might wait too long and you know then you know have too many problems in getting and they may not be able to get it clear but it's a lot that goes into it sometimes you can't even find out who owns the, the rights to the music and you know that's yeah. another issue well you know what uh, a big question comes across my mind because I know just like um, a lot of people back in the day were writing um, song tracks and you had like a compilation. You had a lot of different people contributing to the soundtrack. And I remember there was one uh, movie a couple of years ago, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but Jay-Z wrote like everything. So I'm thinking about like how much money can a songwriter expect to make for using a song in a movie? And Jay-Z like took up the whole score of songs that was allotted for that movie. So he made out really big. Yeah, well, it's a couple of things going on there. Number one is, is, where is it in the movie? And also, I should say, too, that sometimes a movie is separate from the soundtrack. So just because you're in the movie doesn't mean you're going to be in the soundtrack or okay. vice versa. Good point. So as far as it being actually in the movie, um, it really varies a lot depending on, for example, is it under the credits? Is it how much of the song do they play? Do they play 10 seconds or do they play 30 seconds? Or are the characters in the movie, are they singing the song in the movie? So it's kind of like the more they use it, right. the more prominent it is, then the more you can expect to get paid. I mean, you know, it, you, it may be hard, maybe especially in these times, to get up close to six figures, but that's uh -huh. just a ballpark. But okay. um, it just really depends a lot. It's hard to say... Um, you know, because most of the time it's in the background, but also you got to think about there's a song that's already created and right. distinguish that too from a song that was written specifically for the movie. Right. And as far as the soundtracks, you know, that's kind of like treated for the most part just like any other record, and that's just going to be based on, you know, how the record sales. Uh, do on that right well you know the movie came back to me it was american gangster that was with you know jay-z's music. oh now yeah i believe it. he had a lot of music right in that movie didn't he yeah and you know one of the things that happens these days is that um a lot of the recording industry is controlled by companies that also have film studios like sony and places like that so a lot of times they only want their artists who are on their recording, affiliated recording company to be on the soundtrack. So you might have a song that's in the movie and still not be able to get on the soundtrack because of uh, those kind of, you know, business connections like that. Well, I remember an old movie that's one of my favorites. Um, and I remember it was called Sparkle. And Curtis Mayfield actually did the song, the soundtrack, which um, featured Aretha Franklin on all the vocals. But in the movie all of the artists that were actually in the movie were singing the music. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was like Irene King. Yeah. And, yeah. And so that's a more extensive license. And then another thing too is like, if they make a movie about a, a musician, um, they still might have to go back and get those separate music rights because the, the musician may not even own or control their own music rights and so mm -hmm. just because for example and i'm not saying it was this case with this movie but in you know the ray charles movie everybody we all know um 
So just because you're doing a life story of Ray Charles doesn't necessarily mean you can include his music in there without going through some of the processes that we just talked about. So that music stuff really can be involved when it comes to film. And not just film, but TV right. commercials and mm -hmm. television shows, too. Uh, same kind of rules apply. Exactly, because you see a lot of people now like are getting into making their own movies. I mean, you see it all over YouTube. And so they're taking it a step further with, oh, I'm going to make a whole movie. And I'm going to dump some music on here. But, you know, what is the filmmaker, if you love a song, but you can't find out who actually owns the rights to it, should you be using that music at all? Well, good question, because that happens sometimes, and um, there are two ways you can do it. One, you could, um, well, one thing you could do is just and do it, but if you do that, you've got to make sure that you made some pretty serious efforts to track down who that songwriter was or who owned that master, because if you have made a good faith effort to determine who owns the rights, but you just can't uh, make any leeway on that, and you go ahead and use it, then you'll, you'll probably be able to work it out after the fact and enter into your agreements afterward. But you've got to definitely have a paper trail showing that you've tried. Um, and then if you, if you don't feel comfortable with that, then the other thing you might do is just uh, hire a composer, songwriter, to create some music, original music for the production. Um, then that way, you know, you can control more of the rights and probably do it on a one-time fee so you don't uh -huh. have to, uh, you know, pay any kind of royalties or anything like that. And that's where you come in. <laughs> they need to call uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and give out your information, Jonathan. As always, you give us great information each and every month, and we want to make sure that our audience can connect with you to get the record straight, get all the information that you have to give them. Yeah, if you want to... Check me out through my website. It's jbnlegal.biz.biz. Or if you want to call, we still do talk on the phone. The phone number is 404-920-8040. That's 404-920-8040. That's how you would connect with Jonathan Mason from the Mason Law Group, ladies and gentlemen. He's on with us each and every week. Get at them. Get some great information because we want to make sure that you guys are protected in all things that you do. And, Jonathan, we're going to see you next month, same place and same time. All right. We'll do it again. Check us out. The SSB. All right. Jonathan Mason. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.